Scout. Hello, everybody. Scout is uh, spotting something outside. This is my first shameless use of a visual aid. We used to call it back in my speech days at uh, Long Beach State. And uh, I'm going to make a whole lot of points about coronavirus in this and the next session. Possibly a third we might be able to get it uh, done in two. Anyway, Cliff Kelly and Scout greeting you again from a lovely day in Colorado Springs. Um, you can make whatever you want out of this for now. I'll explain more of my reason uh, for putting this on. No, I'm not going to keep it on. Uh, but I am making several statements with it. And uh, for the sake of our topic today, I thought that'd be a good way. We used to call that attention getting, shameless attention getting device, but I bet you it got your attention. You're thinking, why did he do that? What does he mean? What is his political ideology? What is his theology? Now, uh, we're going to talk a lot today, by the way, in the form of a, mm, not a disclaimer so much as a, a warning up front. We're going to go do some heavy sledding today, a graduate level sort of uh, proto seminar on science, theology, and philosophy. The only reason I'm saying that, not trying to impress you, but to lay the groundwork for what I want to cover in the meat of this thing for uh, the second installment, I really need to lay down some principles that we get from both science and theology. And the good news about that is I think you'll see uh, why I still believe and pretty much always have as a Christian that sound doctrine and sound science are never in disagreement. Never. Um, outside of that, uh, there's a whole lot of disagreement. So I'm uh, going to talk today about notes on God, coronavirus, and the American crisis. Biblical reflections on the butterfly effect. I have uh, not done this depth, this degree of depth of research on that, and therefore my plunging into uh, science, theology, and philosophy to to get some new handles, some refreshing course on what we're going to be talking about today. Because we can't avoid medical science, uh, uh, the physical sciences, uh, basic philosophy, and most important of all, uh, sound theology, sound doctrine in dealing with all this. So, as my friend Dr. Randy Pruitt would say, I've used this before, button up your bootstraps, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah, Wisconsin. Anyway, that's where he's from. Uh, let's say a quick prayer and we're going to get on to this. I'm probably going to read more than I normally would because this is pretty uh, at times dense stuff and I don't want to mess it up uh, too much trying to minimize my mistakes. So let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for the hour in which you have designed us to live. Uh, you ordered us up to be born and to live and breathe and have our being in this year, 2020, <laughs> as the nation and the world seems to be flying apart, coming apart at the seams. You knew that before the first sounds broke, before we were even in our mother's womb. You knew that and you planned for us to be a participant in it. And that is high praise and high privilege for allowing us to be here. And I mean that. I don't mean that in sarcasm. I don't mean that in any wryness. That is my my true expression of my heart. Now, help us do this. This is pretty heavy stuff. It's above my pay grade at certain points, and I need your help um, all the more. We love you, and we thank you for your truth. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, uh, as always, start out with, well, let me give you the scripture first. The, the scripture is self-evident. It, it pretty much preaches or teaches itself, but that's all right. Human beings are very good at lots of words to explain something that's probably going to be self-evident as soon as I read this. Uh, you all know it. Most of you know it well. Uh, this is from the prophet Hosea 8, 7. Well-known passage. For they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no meal. If it were to yield, strangers and aliens would eat it up. There's so much there. Uh, that that relates directly to what we're dealing with, beloved. Um, but I'm going to save some for later. I'm going to save some for the next time. And uh, we'll see where we go. Here are uh, two or three quotations. The first one is from Dean Koontz. You may have read him, an extraordinary novelist. Uh, I have not read a lot of him, but um, 
I found one quote from the center, excuse me, from the corner of his eye, published in 2000, one of his better known uh, works. And he makes the point in a very positive way. We're going to make it later in some negative ways that I'm going to be talking about today concerning the butterfly effect. Here's what he writes. Each smallest act of kindness reverberates across great distances and spans of time, affecting lives unknown to the one whose generous spirit was the source of this good echo. Because kindness is passed on and grows each time it's passed until a simple courtesy becomes an act of selfless courage years later and far away. Likewise, however, each small meanness, each expression of hatred, each act of evil does quite the opposite. Uh, then we have this from uh, D.L. Moody, all the way back to 1896 in his classic book, Sowing and Reaping, simply stated, the opportunity, now, but all the way back before the turn of the century, listen, listen to the prophetic warning here. It's extraordinary. The opportunity for sowing will not last forever. All the more rich with meaning for us today in 2020, 120 years or so later. There's that number again. It is slipping through our fingers moment by moment. And the future can only reveal the harvest of the seed sown now. Mm. And finally, much more directly from Andy Andrews, entitled The Butterfly Effect, How Your Life Matters. Now, now you see where this is going already. How your life matters. Think of yourself as a butterfly with wings, but not too long. I don't want to keep you up at night. Your life matters. And it will largely matter for better or for worse. We all know that. But here's where science and literature and philosophy and religion and theology begin to converge on this essentially powerful principle. And I love that. And I'm going to quote at the last then, um, How Your Life Matters. This is again from Andy Andrews, published in 2010, and, and summarizes the basic idea of butterfly effect. A butterfly could flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion which would move other molecules of air, in turn moving more molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the planet. Now, we laugh at that. Oh, that's cultural, you know, fantasy. For a long time, I thought that. But the more I got into, and even in this recent review, into some heavy-hitting science uh, developments, I'm not so sure it's mere fantasy. The illustration is extreme, but I think the principle is intact, um, which I hope to demonstrate today. Okay, first thoughts. When I was in graduate school, <laughs> around the time the dinosaurs walked the earth, by the way, <laughs> it seems like it, in the early 1970s, uh, studying for my doctorate degree in philosophy, social, and communication theory, uh, I came across a framework that I had never heard of before that time. And it was to alter the way I started. Now, this is before I found Christ or he found me. Uh, it was to alter the way I think about things. The universe, um, politics, uh, society, culture, uh, my own personal life, family, all of that. And the name of that framework was General Systems Theory, GST. Now, I'm going to get into it later in our topic, in the discussion today. But I wanted to introduce it up front because that happened to me in 1970. And it continues to have a rather profound effect on me as a scholar, as a thinker, and a writer, um, if I can lay claim to those titles. Some would disagree. I hear from on occasion. And I get down to something called a theory of everything. I think that was a movie uh, uh, title, and you know I can never remember the details until the camera goes off. Um, but I use that phrase carefully here. Uh, the holy grail of virtually every scientist, social scientists, physical scientists, astronomers, sociologists, uh, psychologists, we, we have, as a, as a hunt for the grail, uh, if you will, the search for a covering law, a theoretical framework that would explain everything. Isaac Newton, that I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, believed in that as well. Thought he'd found it, by the way, in his Four Laws of Motion. He thought, that's it. I've discovered everything I need to discover, and we can explain everything. 
Uh, well, uh, partially true. It explained a lot. Newtonian physics took us a long way until something called quantum physics came along uh, somewhat later. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, theory of everything. Um, let me read here what I have. Is to discover an ultimate covering law that would explain everything from the formation of star systems down to the way human beings make decisions, as well as to accurately describe how protons and neutrons behave in a vacuum when they're up in space, and even how quarks interact with one another in more predictable fashion. Right now, our state of the knowledge is we can't predict quarks. Quarks, you know, and they're trying to say, well, that proves the universe is completely random. Wrong. We just haven't found the tools to measure their conduct yet. Um, well, I, again, getting ahead of myself because I find all of this rather fascinating. This is stuff I got into to some degree in graduate school, and it was just uh, my my two years on the doctorate in Bowling Green. Ohio at university was uh, somebody who wrote this phrase. Maybe you can recall it in the thread. A rush of reason. I believe it was a Christian thinker. But that's what that two years for me was. A rush of reason. Then later in Christianity, when I started getting into some of its uh, strong worldview perspective stuff and Systematic, well, not systematic theology. Uh, actually, it's practical theology more than that. Um, and then later in the last five years, I tell you the truth. I don't think anything compares to what's happened to my thinking since 2015. And I think a lot of you can relate to that. It's like I'm getting an advanced degree at the doctoral level in practical theology and cultural analysis and basic common moral sense. Uh, I thank God for these last five years. Although I was praying this morning with tears, I thank him for getting me to this place, but oh my, oh my, what I had to do and what you've had to endure to get here. It's been hard, but it's been worth it. So uh, before I get into general systems, let me get into something that's absolutely fundamental to everything we're gonna talk about today and next week. First cause. A first cause. A scientific revolution of sorts has taken place among the community of more conservative scholars, researchers and scholars, since English astronomer Fred Hoyle was credited with coining the term the Big Bang during a talk for a March 1949 British Broadcasting Company uh, 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 presentation. Um, the theory is based on the hypothesis then that now listen to this, all the matter in the universe was, this is huge for science. Science is bathed in the evolutionary theory. Listen to this, uh, in 1949, the hypothesis that all the matter in the universe was created, created in one big bang, a particular time, a particular micro moment, if you will, in the remote past, when everything we know is reality started. Now, I know uh, Christian scientists, you know, not that kind of Christian scientists, uh, scholars, theologians are still arguing about whether or not the Big Bang theory fits and conforms to uh, the, 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 the biblical text. The principle does. In the beginning was, scientists would say, the Big Bang. That he can't explain, by the way, or she can't explain in terms of how did that come out of Nowhere, ex nihilo, Christian would say, in the beginning, God. So I, I remember seeing a cartoon a long time ago. Scient they're climbing up a mountain. We'll call the mountain Sinai. They're climbing up the mountain. Here's the scientist over here. Here's the theologian over here. And they climb and they climb and they climb and they get to the top. And at the top is Yahweh and the Decalogue, the commandments. They both find that first cause. Now, you would presume theologians already knew that. Not all of them do, I found out. They should. Scientists don't. So we're coming to an apex of sorts in science and theology and philosophy that I find heartening. Um, anyway, again, I'm getting ahead of the text. So what I'm arguing for is that a paradigmatic shift began with the institution of two systems. General systems theory in 1949 and 
the Big Bang, or 1949. Well, they're about the same year, which I find interesting. 4950, Big Bang Theory and General Systems Theory. They came about at the same essential moment in Western history, in human history. I don't think that's coincidental. I don't believe in that kind of universe. I believe that God is supreme. He's sovereign. He rules. He mandated that these two perspectives would come forth because they would generate, we used to call it heroism. They would generate all kinds of fruitful and helpful and healthy intellectual and spiritual uh, speculation at first and then discovery. All right, all right. Uh, so hold on to your armchairs here. We're about to steam through some heavy uh, uh, philosophical, theological, and scientific waters. I'll try to summarize it in more simple terms because sometimes I just got to stay a simple thinker. Remember, uh, see, I, memories. Jim Sepulveda, one of my mentors, the guy was amazing. I can tell you, Sepulveda stories till the Lord comes back. Great man of God. I think he was just a simple man, truck driver or something like that. Great man of God. I was sitting on a podium one time to give my testimony back in the 80s. I was really nervous. I, I was just really nervous. This is all still pretty new to me back then. And he turned to me and he saw that I was terrified getting up and speaking for all these people. And he put a hand, put a hand on my arm. And all he, and he whispered to me, keep it simple. Keep it simple. It's a German evangelist, Reidhard Bonnke, who from South Africa, who would, whether or not it's controversial, I don't care right now. Uh, he's led millions to the Lord. And he would start most of his crusades uh, throughout Africa with yelling into the microphone through an interpreter, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep it simple. We, we're going to go through some complex waters, but I'm going to do what I can to pare it down to some simple principles. I think that's what a good teacher is supposed to do. All right, in accordance with good advice. Uh, so let's start with theology. Uh, in, uh, and I take this basically from Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Encyclopedia Britannica, two of my favorite sources. I know they're secular, but you know they know some stuff too. Um, to give you an idea of two kinds of approaches to a first cause. The scientific approach isn't going to be uh, uh, satisfactory, and even uh, the summary of the theological approach isn't going to be satisfactory. But let's, uh, let's try it on for size. Theology. First cause in philosophy refers to the self-created being. Yeah, I know, I know, but that's the best they could do. Uh, let's just thank God for the admission that that being was there. Uh, self-created being, uh, that is God, to which every chain of causes must ultimately go back. This is big. This is huge philosophically, intellectually, scientifically, and theologically because the very admission of a first cause is massively in favor of a Christian, a Judeo-Christian perspective. It, it's very important. All the, you know, the, the loose ends notwithstanding. So I get excited about that. All right, let me read on. The, third, the term was used by Greek thinkers and began, uh, became an underlying assumption in the Judeo-Christian tradition, beginning with middle, middle, medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas, argue, argue, who argued in Summa Theologica, I've never met a human being that has ever read the whole thing. And if you are one, I want you to write to me. I'll put you on camera. You can teach us a bunch of stuff. Doesn't mean Aquinas was right in everything, but what a, what a massive work. Who taught that the observable order of causation is not self-explanatory. It's not. It can only be accounted for by the existence of a first cause. This first cause, however, must not be considered simply as the first in a series of continuing causes. Can you say multi-universe? Nonsense. Um, but rather uh, the, the cause for the whole series of all observable causes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, whew, big stuff. Now let's go to science. Uh, and this is from one of the, this is from the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. 
uh, science. The critique of pure reason that first published in 1781 by the German philosopher Immanuel Kant maintained that causation was one of the fundamental concepts that rendered the empirical world comprehensible to humans. If there isn't a first cause, it will all be chaos. It, I mean, nothing would make sense. There would be no agreed upon moral system. There would, there would be no ethics. There would be no reason. It would just be all chaos. We'd probably last a fortnight, as Kant argued. Now, there's a bunch of definitions here. I'm just going to read the first because it'll make you see stars in your eyes. Causation consists, for example, in the instant instantiation of exceptionalist regularities. Out of that, I pull one word, regularity. The universe behaves more or less, even at our infantile understanding of it, in regular fashion. That's why we got men to the moon in 1969. That's why doctors can still bring healing to a body by observing and understanding and researching and, and comprehending uh, certain, certain laws of uh, human physiology, etc., etc., etc. There is some regularity, regularity in the universe. I know they, you know, theologians, philosophers still debate that. I don't. I just know it. And I can, you know, I don't have to be a physicist. But as I say so many times, I can read. By the way, I recommend reading. It's a good idea. Uh, in a society that's largely put it aside. In summary, stated more simply yet elegantly, the fundamental idea of causation is simply how we make both practical and moral sense of the universe. If you can't predict anything, anything, and we're kind of in a time right now where that's rather painful to reflect upon in terms of coronavirus, but we'll get to that. If it did not exist, then all would be sheer chaos, uncertainty, and ultimately disintegration of the order of reality. It would just not be there. Um, so we subscribe as Judeo-Christian monotheists. We subscribe to the idea that there is regularity that helps the universe, watch the phrase, enable it to, to, to observe the truth that all things hold together by that first cause and those regularity, those laws of regularity. If those two elements weren't there, we would make sense of anything. And of course, that reminds me of the delicious passage in Colossians 1.17. And he himself, that is Jesus Christ, existed and is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the controlling, cohesive force of the entire universe. And if not for him, the first cause, the creator, who, who issued forth those laws of regularity that we're still learning about, both in Newtonian and quantum physics. There wouldn't be anything. There wouldn't be any order. There wouldn't be anything that we know as, as reality. Theologian William MacDonald writes, I think eloquently, you know, I love this guy, uh, this principle of divine causation in this way. Paul says he is before all things, not he was, before all things, but that he is before all things. The present tense is often used in the Bible to describe the timeless, time, timeliness of deity. The Lord Jesus said, for example, before Abraham, I am, not I was, I am. Uh, not only did the Lord Jesus exist before there is any creation, but also in him all things consist. Lots more there. You can read it on your own. Uh, let's go down to uh, a topic, a, a heading I use, Queen of the Sciences. I've introduced that to you two or three times already. Uh, science could learn a few things from theology. Theology can learn a few things from science. We're not all about being pompous, but they would always agree with the theologian. They would always agree with the sacred text. No science, science principle would ever be allowed to disagree with the text so long as we had an under, the proper and accurate understanding of the text. Theologians have been known for millennia now for being for screwing it up, both Jewish and Christian theologians. There are good ones and bad ones. Uh, I suggest you follow the good ones. Um, so queen of the sciences means that while all of human... That was created, by the way, in the medieval era of... Uh, 
uh, what are called the high middle ages when schools were divided in classical liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. But there was one discipline that governed them all, and that was theology, God and his divine revolution. Uh, revelation. Revolution isn't bad either. Ruled and governed all human knowledge. Still does, whether we recognize it or not. Uh, general system theory. Oh, this is a little bit turgid, and I got and I got a rough here. I actually got a little bit weary here going through all this stuff. But again, this is a platform for understanding what we, what we uh, to be established for understanding what comes next. Very important to me. Um, so the breakthrough framework for many of us in the social sciences occurred with the publication uh, by Austrian biologist Carl Ludwig von Bertalanffy. I was introduced to him in 1970. And I have them in the same sense. Hmm. Uh, who published his landmark article, An Outline of General System Theory, published in the British Journal uh, for Philosophy of Science in 1950. Okay, there's the 50. Note the proximity in years, again, I mentioned before, between the institution of the Big Bang Theory and General System Theory. One year, a few months apart, not accidental. Here's an overview by Tim, uh, systems engineer, science writer, Tim Wilkins, uh, who talks about the origins of systems theory. Go through it real quick, and then I'm going to blast through the rest to get to the good stuff, uh, through the necessary stuff. Origins. General systems theory was founded by uh, Ver von Bertolanffy, 1950. He carved out common features from different fields of knowledge and described them in his work, General System Theory, uh, published later in 1969. In the sense of general systems theory, uh, technical systems are only one of many possible fields of applications. In other words, remember back to the covering all, back, back to the Holy Grail, back to the theory of everything. General systems theory comes very close to that because it can describe events in economics, sociology, psychology, human social systems, family system, family therapy. And I used a book <clears throat> by Paul Voslowick, a Viennese psychiatrist for many years, called The Pragmatics of Human Communication, that borrowed from this uh, systems approach. And it worked beautifully to help us to understand family systems and mental illness. Uh, Gregory Bateson and others wrote from a systems perspective on how, uh, it's called theory of the double bind, how schizophrenia can possibly emerge in a family system. Okay, okay, okay. I'm not trying to impress. I just, all these memories are rushing back here. I recall an even broader application of systems theory. I remember, I don't have it here, a book bigger than McDonald's commentary, oh, nearly 1,200 pages long, by James Greer Miller. I, I got it back in, uh, see when it was published, 78, and I was so proud of myself, this huge volume of science stuff. I devoured probably 150 to 200 pages and then uh, went out and had a beer back those days when I did that sort of thing. It was nasty. But the, the beauty of it was, and he's an evolutionist, uh, but the beauty of it, he described a scientific framework that ex could explain seven levels of human life, of, of biologic life. Uh, seven levels, including uh, cellular, organic, organismic, group, organizational, societal, and supernatural. And he uses the same principles and the same algorithms to, to lay them across those seven levels. And that gets us a little closer as a scientist now, from my science hat, uh, as a scientist to, to understanding symmetrically how different systems at different levels behave similarly. And there are even Isaac Newton's uh, ideas. Uh, were, were somewhat uh, predictive of this idea. All right. Uh, so we now have to differentiate between two kinds of causation, linear and uh, circular. I'm going to do this very briefly. I'm going to move on because I'm getting a stomach cake. <laughs> this is, you know, I, I kept saying to the Lord, I, God, I, I don't know if I can do this. And I didn't hear a voice, but the basic thing was just do it um, or try it. Linear causality, Christian physicist Isaac Newton. By the way, he was a Christian. You know what his favorite activity was? It wasn't mathematics and physics. You know what it was? Trying to calculate when Jesus was coming back. And I got to tell you, he got it to, 
He got it down to, as I recall, the 21st century. He got it within like, I don't know, 50 years. Uh, if, if the Lord comes back and within that now in 2050. Uh, guy was a dude and he loved Jesus. He was absolutely obsessed with eschatology and uh, the second coming. All right, a little side note for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so based on his work, he came up with his four laws of motion. Uh, the third law of motion of which <laughs> explains the fundamental idea here about causation. All of this has a great deal to do with coronavirus and what's happening with it as it proliferates. Believe it or not, we start here and then we'll get to there next time. Here's the third law of motion that everybody quotes to this day. When one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body simultaneously exerts a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the first body. Cause leads to an effect inexorably every time. And good mathematicians and physicists can measure the, imp the, 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 uh, the, the uh, characteristics of the, the first cause and predict the effects upon a second cause. Indeed, how men get from the earth to the moon. This is huge in terms of, uh, of basic physics and uh, basic science. Okay, so one, one scientist uh, stated it a little bit differently. I'm looking at my time. Oh my gosh. Um, Newtonian causality, the law of cause and effect, is brought to light as a part of the met metaphysics of Newton's theory of motion in scrutinizing Newton's definitions and laws of motion with respect to the true meaning of force as cause. There had <laughs> think immediately it was Star Wars. Sorry. Um, there had, there has to be a first force in the universe to cause all that we see out there. That is wondrous and incredible. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, that singing group, uh, oh, now I can't remember them. I love them. They, uh, they used a lot of drums, uh, and, uh, and uh, they were, they apparently are visiting Colorado and they had a video of them just driving up as they got near Colorado Springs. The guy almost drove off the road. It's so pretty here. He really is. I uh, call it the Magic Kingdom. I used to work for Disney um, in the biblical sense, in the C.S. Lewis sense. It's very pretty here. Um, weather is crazy, but it's beautiful. here. I don't even know why I said all that. Uh, there had to be a creator of this. There had to be a first force in geologic sciences to create all this, in astronomical sciences. Uh, circular causality, though, scientists got to, when they got into quantum physics and studying quarks, and, and they saw that they couldn't predict squat, it's an old Latin term, um, they, they could not predict the conduct of subatomic particle, particle physics. They just didn't make sense of it. Now, the conclusion was, I mentioned it earlier, well, you know, the universe isn't regular after all. The laws don't work after all. Yeah, they do. We just haven't discovered the ones that that supervise and superintend uh, quantum physics. Uh, if there's enough time, and if God is gracious, he'll allow men to discover that as well. Not sure we will uh, in time. A little, little fear appeal there. Um, so circular causality, later scientists began to reconceptualize the universe in terms of greater complexity, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the advent of general systems theory, quantum physics, and chaos theory. We're going to get to that a little bit today, if I ever do. Um, here's an observation that will neatly serve as kind of a bridge of transfer from what we've talked about now to this next phase that gets us closer to chaos theory and the butterfly effect. All right, here's a, just a bit of the statement because I don't have time to do the whole thing. Scientists have tr traditionally had a rather strict cause and effect view of the natural world. English physicist Newton taught us that. On the other hand, scientists have always realized that some events in nature appear to be just too complicated, too complex, uh, to analyze by the known laws of science. One of the best examples is weather patterns. Now, I mentioned living in Colorado Springs. We have a going joke here. If you're a weather uh, scientist, don't come here and go to work. I mean, I've got two different applications on my phone for the day's weather. I would say if I was running a correlation coefficient between the, the two, 
on a good day, it'd be 0. 0.5, 0. 0.49 to 50. <laughs> you know, and, and the silly little example is, oh, well, it's going to be sunny for three days. Wash my car. You all know what happens. It has a thunderstorm that afternoon. This is the nature of Colorado Springs. But more broadly, this is the nature of trying to predict God's weather systems. Guess what? Mankind hasn't done a real good job of it, though we've improved. Though we've improved. Um, or they have improved. Uh, so, uh, that's the initial statement. Let's just keep it simple for now. Uh, I remember, well, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, for those of you who are statisticians and uh, uh, univariate analysis uh, is a standard standard uh, set of uh, mathematical and principal uh, things that I minored in uh, in data analysis in college, in graduate school. But I was introduced also not only general system theory, but I was also introduced to something called multivariate data analysis. Whole new world with the advent of the computer opened up to us. And we were able to explain and describe vastly more complex systems by using multivariate data analysis. dry throat from talking too fast. So uh, I get them to chaos theory and butterfly wings. I don't know if that makes any sense to you at all, but God told me to do this, so blame him if it No, <laughs> if this isn't going too well. I love this stuff. I'm just a little bit out of my element. It's been a long time. Here's a wonderful introduction of these two highly related formulations, chaos theory and the butterfly effect, from American scientist writer Jamie Vernon. Uh, his introduction is pretty good, pretty clear. Nearly 50 years ago, during the 139th meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1972, mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz posed a question. This is where we get into the, the, the good stuff. Posed a question at the conference. Very shy man. He didn't even want to go to the conference, but his colleague, the guy's a genius, they said, you got to go and get your ideas out there. Here's the question. Listen now. Does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? Yeah, this is to the, the scientific elites at the leading conference of the time in 1972. There were those who, uh, you know, laughed and guffawed and mocked and made fun of him. But there were some who listened. Uh, and it's a good thing they did. Uh, the uh, Wilkins writes, the purpose of his provocative question was to illustrate the idea that some complex dynamical systems exhibit unpredictable behaviors such that, this is what I want you to remember now, small variances in the initial condition or first causes could have profound and widely divergent effects on the system's outcomes that were vast and, and rather broad. Just from a tiny little thing. Think coronavirus, boys and girls. Little tiny microbe. Well, you know what stimulated this? In the last couple of months, I've just, I've been walking around, you know, like a wandering Jew that I am, and, and I mumble a lot. We, we do that. If you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, just think of Tevia. He's mumbling to God all day long. That's what I do in the Jewish tradition. And I kept mumbling the same kind of, God, one tiny microbe that isn't even visible with the naked eye, you have... You have brought the world to a near standstill, dropped it to its knees, not always in the right way. One microbe? Yes. Whatever your theology that he sent this thing or he permitted this thing, y'all can debate about it in your living room. I'm astounded by that. And I know most of you are too. It's astounding. No, I don't believe in this Conspiracy view that it's not a thing. And I do wear this wherever uh, stores have a little sign outside. You know, not permitted in until you have a mask. No, I'm not going to go demonstrate in the streets and burn down a building because you're making me wear a mask. I want to take care of the ones in the in the store that have asked me to do this. This isn't protect to me. As I said last time, this is to protect them. Pretty good. It's an N95 <laughs> or I was going to say a Chinese knockoff of an N95. I don't even know anymore. I should probably look where this was made. Um, is that bad to say? Yeah, it's just the way I am. Um, so this is where quantum physics and chaos theory comes along to try to understand 
and get their arms around normally unpredictable events like weather systems. Or another example I have here somewhere. What about two siblings? Same parents, they're only one or two years apart. Uh, same upbringing, same teaching, went to the same schools, same relative physical health, uh, same sports, same clubs they joined, la, 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 la. One grows up to be a tremendous success in his professional or her professional field. The other one becomes a heroin addict and dies at age 30. Psychologists are tearing their hair out trying to understand, what? There's a lot of research going on with twins, for example. What? What, what initial conditions and transitional uh, conditions and variables explain that difference? All right, well, that's kind of a poor example, I guess, of, of what all this is trying to do. Let me also give you a little bit of insight to the man. I, I love uh, Mr. Lorenz in retrospect because uh, how he was described by his students and colleagues. Listen to this from an article by Peter DeZykes uh, in Technological Review. Published in, gosh, 2011. Here's how he describes uh, Lorenz. A legend in the MIT classroom. Guy was a genius. Lorenz earned students' votes as the meteorolo meteorology department's best teacher year after year. Quote, if it, oh, I got to make a change here. Hold on. Eventually, the award was discontinued because no one else ever won it after Lorenz won it a few times. Uh, science colleagues, Carrie, colleague Carrie Emanuel recalls, yet Lorenz's research went largely unnoticed for a decade. Didn't toot his own horn. Ed was a very shy man, he writes, who was as far from being a self-promoter as you could possibly imagine, Mr. Emanuel said. He didn't go off giving scientific talks a lot. They had to practically carry him to the conference to present his ideas that changed the scientific world uh, to this very day. I like that. God likes that. It's called humility. And uh, I just wanted to bring that into the discussion. His best quote ever. I love this. He said in 1970, or his report in 1972, if the flap of a butterfly's wings can be instrumental in generating a tornado, it can equally well be instrumental in preventing the tornado. And that's the goal of the right-minded and rightly motivated scientist, to help mankind, to help him avoid harm. Uh, not dissimilar at all to the uh, Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. So uh, there's a scripture that I've been repeating for years, but it takes on new meaning here. Oh my gosh, I gotta go. Uh, Zechariah 4.10, listen to this about small initial conditions, small things. Despise not, do not despise the small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. We could teach that for a month. But the point being, as with, as with Lorenz, don't despise the quiet, humble, discreet, almost hidden uh, beginning of something. A, a, a kind of a humiliating start, if you will. Don't despise that. Everything, everything has a beginning. And I've always said, and this isn't in the text, all great things start small. All great things always start small, without exception. Uh, so a couple of words, despise from the Hebrew word meaning to disrespect or hold in contempt, to scorn, to mock. Don't do that. Don't describe the humble man, the humble woman, the humble child, their humble efforts. Don't do that. You have no idea what it's going to become. You know, think of any great music artist or, or scientist. They had to start somewhere and their beginnings were ridiculous. I, uh, I like to see videos of uh, great musical artists, for example, when they were like nine and ten. And they sounded terrible. But they were being molded for their calling. They were. I think God had a hand in it, and uh, especially if they, they went in good directions. But yeah, and small things taken from the Hebrew katan, the least, the smallest, the least important, the youngest, the weakest, the most insignificant. Does that sound like Jesus to you? Does to me. Does to me. 
the principle. This means that something very, very small can produce at first a small ripple effect, SRE, I invented that, issuing from a relatively obscure cause, then eventually cascade into an exponential ripple effect, ERE, engulfing an entire population of some kind. I got to finish in a few minutes. Commentary, Matthew Henry, Albert Barnes, about small things leading to larger things. I'll let you read that. My take, DK's take, as we draw this section to a close, I want you all to remember that this, remember this as God's principle of the minuscule. God does not despise the minuscule. No, he attends to, he attends to every sparrow that falls to the ground and dies. He counts every hair on the top of your head. Oh, my God. I'm, I always want to turn. There's that weird guy. He's about, oh, I don't know. He's got a bald head, long white beard, and almost no clothes. Yeah, that's a little distracting. I've told you about it before. He walks up the streets, you know, his little speedos. Anyway, I'm sorry. I over-disclosed, but, I mean, I'm, I am I got to look at it. So if you want to know why I twitch every now and then, that sort of thing. Um, okay, uh, bah, 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 bah. so now consider, in light of what I've been saying, in a kind of a shambly way, it's a new word I invented, Galatians 5 9, 5 9. Listen to this. It just came to me this morning in the midst of my about 14th edit of this thing. That's not quite accurate. A little bit of leaven, a slight inclination to error, or a few false teachers or teachings leavens the whole lump and they amplified it perverts the whole conception of faith or misleads the whole church lots of applications of these principles just a little bit of leaven 80% truth 20% a lie and the church is overthrown in a decade or less now consider couple of examples. I don't have time to go into it. Think of the two, only two of the ten spies who were courageous to take on Nephilim to gain the land of promise, or Gideon's army of 32,000. God whittles it down to 300. Gideon saying, oh, what? What? You know, the same guy that says when he was called the old great and valiant warrior, he looked over his shoulder and said, what are you talking about? It can't be me. That's a good attitude to hold. That's a good attitude to or the creator of the entire universe, the sustainer of all things, almighty God, being born in a small, smelly feeding trough in a nondescript cave of some kind 2,000 years ago. All great things begin small. More negatively, small fraction of the population that led and carried out the October, the October Revolution in Russia. In 1917, I couldn't find it, but I remember reading many years ago, there's like 150 guys out of a population of millions overthrew the Russian monarchy. Or the Nazi party overthrew the entire Weimar Republic in Germany in 1933. Or the failed French Revolution in 1789, just started by a few, comparatively few, provocateurs leading to the reign of terror. Enter COVID-19, getting to the end. Medically named NCOV-2019 or novel, novel coronavirus of 2019. There is in the world today the existence and proliferation of a tiny little microbe. I've got the scientific measurements down here. I don't even know what it means. Measuring no more than 120 nanometers across. 10 to the ninth power, you know, you can read it. You you mathematicians tell me what this means in the threat, okay? It's tiny, not ob observable by the naked eye. I'm not even sure observable by this guy. Uh, microscopic, microscopic. In commoner parlance, this means about 0.00047244 inches in diameter. We're talking tiny. We're talking tiny. A very small thing indeed we ought not despise, wouldn't you say? Impact. Impact. 
Today, I'm going to close with the impact in terms of what we see in the news events. Just today, just pulled out uh, 10 to 12 headlines for you to think about. Next time, and what I've been thinking about, because I, you know, I'm, I, I'm built this way. I think in broad terms. I'm thinking of this tiny little microscopic pebble dropped in an ocean, and its ripple effects first small, and it's just like a tidal wave now throughout the entire planet. I'm fascinated by that, both as a Christian and as a scientist, I, I'm fa and a philosopher. I'm fascinated by it. One tiny little, one tiny little micro. I'm hesitating in saying the second thing. It's not in the script. If America does not repent, if pastors don't take the lead and lead us into what that brilliant rabbi that I just published on my page wrote so eloquently and thoroughly, we don't first recognize our participation in this holocaust of microbiology. It's only the first of many, beloved. There's more to come. There's more to come. Read about it in the Bible. Read about it in my book. Wherever you're going to get it. There's more to come. This is the first tiny salvo. And look what it's done. Here's some of the headlines. July, worst month ever for COVID-19 infections. Infections, I'm talking about America. Over 25,000 deaths in a month. Ah, it's only the flu. Florida, record high for the fourth straight day. 25 states being uh, spiking in infections. Fauci, Dr. Fauci, who some believer, uh, some some believers, some leading politicians think is uh, sent by the devil. He doesn't know anything. Quote, no end in sight. Fear mongering, what purpose would he have? New Jersey warning sign. Survivors could lose their hearing. Camp sees a majority of kids infected. You know, it was okay to do it. So they went in and took their precautions and majority are sick now. Major League Baseball is on the brink. I've been watching, check, spot watching, I think it was the uh, St. Louis Cardinals today or last night, and they're thinking of shutting down now because a third of their team is infected with a little cardboard figures in the state. It's all so pathetic and sad. It's just very sad. Thousands in Berlin are protesting virus restrictions as they're doing here. I'm reading news accounts of people pulling guns on store owners for insisting they wear a mask. Seriously? Does this thing limit my freedom to do whatever I need to do? No. No. Ask me to do some other things and I'll we'll talk about that. Not this. Not this. Inconvenient? Yeah. Plus other things going on in the world that don't relate to coronavirus, except if you think in terms of butterfly effects. Hurricane Isaias. I couldn't believe that name when I heard it for the first time yesterday. Isaiah Isaias means in the Hebrew, God saves. Skirting the entire, just watch the, uh, the, uh, the forecast today. It runs all the way from the tip of Florida to Massachusetts. Skirt, if the models are correct, skirting the entire, it's only category one, skirting the entire East Coast, all the way from north to south. Hmm. Hmm. 40 million Americans out of work. I feel that pain. I haven't worked in three years, but thanks to you guys, we're doing okay now. Your faithfulness, my doing this, and you know your 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 contributions to what I'm doing. I'm not asking for money. Right? I'm just saying, very grateful to God and to you. But I know before this started taking off, I can tell you about looking. I almost took pictures of our bear cupboard about six different times in the last three years. Uh, God says no. I'll have nothing to do with that. Wondering, being on the phone a third of the day trying to get bills postponed. You know, I could cry uh, for this 40 million. 
uh, uh, unemployment insurance of 600 a week just ran out today. No plans in Congress to do anything about it. I'm not talking about ideology. Now I'm just talking about human beings hurting. 33% collapse of the GDP. What? In the Depression, it was 15%. What? And you watch the stock market and you got you to laugh derisively. What? 33% drop in the GDP. I don't have to be an economist to know what that means. That's catastrophic. And I guess personally most troubling for me, a new secret police force unleashed in the cities where indeed there's violence and burning down of buildings. But you know, we already have a police force. We already have National Guard. Uh, secret police uh, doesn't set well with this old Jew. So uh, there's that. Yeah, I guess what I see, you know, I, I just see an America coming apart. I, I read your posts and texts. It makes us weep. It makes us angry. It makes us confused. Unless you have a pretty firm grip on the text. The text. And an accurate understanding of the text. Uh, I don't know if it's this lesson or the next time. I'm going to talk about how cautious and careful we must be in selecting our teachers and pastors. Be very careful. Well, to think on this long and hard, beloved, to appreciate where we're going next with this idea in part two, it's coming Wednesday, which I've titled, a working title only, Ripple Effects from Coronavirus. The butterfly effect of coronavirus. What the heck has happened to the world because of one tiny microbe? And by the way, before we finish this series, what is the real reason that coronavirus was set free? Father, we thank you and praise you for minds that want to know and grasp your mind, your heart, your understanding of these great and mysterious and sometimes terrifying events. But I'm quick to add, Lord, we need not be terrified. We need not even fear. A little anxiety, a few uh -uh, butterflies, if you will are okay, because we're human. But we need not walk in terror so long as we hold you and you hold our hand firmly in the midst of these seismic occurrences in our world today. You're the steady one. You're the rock. You're what's solid and dependable and predictable in terms of never, ever forsaking us, not even once. So to all who know you and all who are getting to know you, I recommend you again. I exalt you again as the only thing, the only creature, the only thought that makes any sense in this crazy world. I love you for it. My fine, my family is grateful. I, I'm, I just close on a wonderful note. I don't know how you're doing it, but my family is more unified now than we have been in all the years and decades we've been together. How the heck does that work? God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Love you all. And it's 58 minutes and 43 seconds. Don't, uh, don't avoid next time. <laughs> I think it'll be interesting. God bless you. Love you.